Good to go. Real quick. All right, Mary Lou, come on back. Oh, we're having quite the pink sunset out the window, probably because of all the smoke. Oh, yeah, probably. Let's see. I gotta look too. Oh, yeah. Oh, wow. Sun is orange. Yeah. I was just looking at my white cat, and she's she's bathed in an, uh, an eerie light. Oh, that's so weird. <laughs> Beautiful, but weird. There we go. So sorry. Thanks. All right. Pamela, should we get started? Okay. All right. So we don't have Melissa. We don't have Melissa anymore. We have Madeline. Yes. Okay. So if we're ready to go, then I'll go ahead and start. Uh, good evening and welcome to the San Bruno Planning Commission meeting for Tuesday, August 18th, 2020. Thank you for everyone uh, for attending tonight's virtual meeting. And thank you again to San Bruno City staff for helping us make the Zoom meeting possible tonight. Um, to the members of our public again, we want to hear from you. If you are in the audience and you would like to address the commission during public comment um, or during a hearing item, but I don't think we have a hearing item, uh, please use the, your raise your hand button in your Zoom tools. And when it's your turn to speak, the city clerk will uh, call your name and unmute you. I think Madeline will un unmute you. Okay. And um, and you'll be given three minutes to address the commission. And if you're joining us by telephone, you can also address us. The, um, the way you do that is by pressing star nine. And Melissa will address you and unmute you. And again, you'll have three minutes. And then again, a quick note to my fellow commissioners, we're gonna continue um, for our remote meetings to do roll call votes. So um, for any votes we'll be doing tonight, we'll continue with roll call. And, um, and speaking of which, I think we're ready for a roll call, Pamela. Of course. Let's do roll call tonight. Chair Lathan? Here. Vice Chair Biafati? Here. Commissioner Hamilton? Here. Commissioner Harmon? Present. Commissioner Johnson? Here. Commissioner Morgan? Here. You have six members, you have a quorum. And Madam Chair, um, there's no public hearing item tonight, so you actually don't need any vote to close or open public hearing. Right. And uh, we only have a study session, so there's no need to take a vote either. Right, except I guess minutes. Yes, good point. Yeah. Okay. Um, okay, then we'll go ahead and do the Pledge of Allegiance, and just to keep things simple, I'll just continue to to lead in the pledge. Okay, whenever you're ready, Madeline. Having technical difficulties, Chair, just one moment. Okay. It's not coming up for me now. I can do it, Madeline. Okay, thank you, Rucha. All right. Great. Okay, here we go. I pledge allegiance to the flag, the flag of, of the United States, States of America, America. and to the republic, the republic for which it stands. One nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Okay. Thank you, guys. Uh, we'll go on to our business items. Uh, first is the approval of the minutes from July 21st, 2020, uh, revised to reflect Commissioner Morgan's attendance. Through the chair? Yes. That we approve the minutes of July 21st with the correction. All right. I second that motion. Wonderful. Uh, we'll go ahead and do, I guess, a roll call vote. Chair Lesson? Aye. 
Vice Chair Biasati? Aye. Commissioner Hamilton? Aye. Commissioner Harmon? Aye. Commissioner Johnson? Aye. Commissioner Morgan? Aye. Motion passes. Thank you. Okay, and then item number two is public comment. And this is an opportunity for members of the public to speak about topics that are not on the agenda. Um, Madeline, do we have any anybody raising their hand or in the waiting room? No, we have no one in the waiting room at the moment. Okay. Okay, thank you. We'll go ahead and move on. You'll have your chance later if you want it. Um, and then announcement of conflict of interest. There should be none. Okay, that's good. And then we can just move on to new business item A, and that's to receive the report um, and provide direction regarding the amendments to San Bruno Municipal Code Title 12, Article 3, Land Use and Zoning as part of a focus code update. Thank you. I'll just get my screen um, set up in one moment. All right. All right, can everyone see my PowerPoint? Yes. Yeah. All right, great. So good evening, planning commissioners. My name is Kelly Beggs, and I'm a contract uh, senior planner with Good City Company. Um, and I'm pleased to present the item before you tonight, which is um, a study session on the zoning code update, um, the next phase of it, which has a housing focus. So I'll start by just letting you know who's working on this initiative. Darcy Smith, Community and Economic Development Director, Pamela, Pamela Wu, Planning and Housing Manager, um, myself, and then Erin Axon, who as you all noted in the beginning of this call, is um, here and is principal of Good City Company. So the meeting objective for this evening is to receive an update and provide direction to staff regarding the draft zoning code ordinance. I'll start with the background and the history behind this update, um, move over to a the new mixed use zoning chapter overview, review affordable housing program requirements, um, and then just let you know which other um, miscellaneous updates we're working on right now, go over next steps, and then we can move on to discussion. So to start with the background, um, in March 2009, the general plan was adopted, um, and then in February 2013, the TCP was adopted. However, following the adoption of these two documents, um, there was no codification of the development standards and zoning districts that were present, especially in the TCP, um, in order to fold those into the zoning code. Um, and that was for a variety of reasons. Um, the recession was ending, ending at that time. Um, the pipeline explosion had happened. So the city was really focused on rebuilding. Um, redevelopment had been dissolved. Um, so there were a couple of different uh, kind of greater influences working together to keep city priorities on other issues. Um, I'll also just uh, review that in November 2014, San Bruno voters did approve Measure N, which was did implement part of the TCP by um, changing the height restrictions in the TCP area. And then in November of 2016, um, there was a downtown walking tour on issues related to the zoning code update that included city council members and member of the members of the public to discuss issues that people were seeing downtown as well as what kind of uses people wanted to envision there and then lastly in february of 2020 the parking chapter was updated by the city council and that was kind of the first step in this new series of code amendments that the city is undertaking so for this phase of the zoning code ordinance update um, the goals are to make sure that the code is consistent with state law where applicable um, so that's especially in relationship to accessory dwelling units and junior accessory dwelling units and um, state density bonus, all of which um, had new state regulations that went into effect this year. Um, next, we also um, aim to increase the amount of sites that are available for housing and strengthen the on-site affordable housing requirements um, to help the city meet its uh, regional housing needs uh, allocation. And then lastly, um, we'll also be clarifying some administrative procedures to help the city efficiently process applications. 
And then other important goals of this update um, include uh, incorporating the general plan, the TCP, and the housing element um, into the zoning code. So I'll start with that overview of the new mixed use zoning code chapter. So here you can see on the right, um, this may look familiar. This is a map of the TCP zoning districts or um, character areas. Um, and a big part of the zoning code update will be to codify the TCP. So that will include um, development of new zoning districts um, in each of these like different colored areas that you see in the photograph on the right. Um, new permitted uses in these areas, so permitting housing um, in all of these areas, um, and then new development standards that will really encourage high quality design. So this table presents um, the permitted uses that are outlined in the TCP itself. Um, so this table will really set the foundation and provides guidance for staff as we move into like a, a more detailed permitted uses table. Um, and that's something that we would like to see some feedback from the Planning Commission on, and I'll talk about that a little bit later. And then next, this actually relates to the general plan. So we're a little bit south of the TCP area um, on El Camino Real, and um, this new uh, code update will also include a new zoning district for the general plan multi-use residential focus land use classification. Uh, this area is, you can see in kind of orange and red hatch along Camino Real, um, and the area is currently zoned commercial or neighborhood commercial, neither of which permit housing. The new permitted uses that are outlined in the general plan are similarly kind of a foundational um, baseline, but those are multifamily and attached single family housing, restaurants, personal and business services, hotels and motels, and um, a variety of offices. And um, retail would only be conditionally permitted in this district because the intention is to really concentrate the retail uses closer to the downtown. So this slide shows you kind of a, a little bit of a zoomed out version of the existing zoning that's um, in this area of the city. And you can see a lot of this more like brownish red that is along El Camino Real, and that is the commercial district, and also goes through this area, which is also part of the TCP. This red hatch is the current CBD. Um, and then as I mentioned, there's some neighborhood commercial zoning also around this part of El Camino Real. Then this would be the new zoning districts. So it should look pretty similar to what you saw in the TCP illustration. Um, this is a new station area. And then this would be the San Bruno Ave Huntington area. Here's the CBD, which is in much the same position um, as it is currently. And then there's an El Camino Real district, which is this kind of purplish color. The dark purple would actually be um, a civic center designation, and that's where City Hall and the fire department currently are. And then moving down south in Camino Real, this is that um, multi-use residential focus area from the general plan that we described earlier. So the key areas of discussion for tonight, um, as I described, uh, the TCP does give us a baseline um, and foundation for which uses should be allowed, but it's not quite as detailed as what staff needs to be able to efficiently process and respond to business owners who are interested in opening businesses or um, developing new projects in the downtown, the TCP area. Um, so staff in particular is interested in creating active pedestrian environment in the CBD. So part of what we're considering is allowing more active uses on the ground floor and permitting less active uses like offices um, on the upper floors. So now I'll move on to the affordable housing discussion. So the, court, the current ordinance um, does have some requirements for affordable housing. Um, those kick in at uh, projects that are greater than five units. The rental projects um, do not have an on-site affordable housing requirement. Um, they do have a fee that's required. Um, there is 
an alternative that they can pursue to provide on-site affordable housing. Um, that's not something that staff sees happening very often. Um, and then for owner projects, these are the amounts that are required for low income and moderate income for, um, for on-site development. However, there's also an alternative to providing affordable housing on-site where the ownership projects can actually also fee out. Um, and this is a bit um, unusual that the city sees this happening fairly frequently um, as developers often find it to be more advantageous financially to uh, apply for a fee rather than to provide the units on-site. So here are some of those alternatives that I discussed um, for the for sale projects. They can pay residential impact fees. They can acquire or rehabilitate affordable units, increase number of bedrooms, provide greater levels of affordability, construct second dwelling units, and then provide rental rather than for sale. Rental projects, as I discussed, and these are the projects that are paying the fee. Instead of paying the fee, they can provide um, on-site units. And then um, for rental and for sale projects, these alternatives are available to both of those. They can provide affordable units off-site, dedicate land, um, or purchase existing units for conversion to affordable units. So something different um, between San Bruno and other jurisdictions is that other jurisdictions really heavily rely on developers to develop um, this housing on-site that it's available at the same time as the market rate units are available. So that's something that staff is interested in strengthening um, and also believe that it could assist the city in better meeting its RENA allocation. And that is actually shown on this slide. So as you can see, the city is not on pace um, for developing units for any of the income brackets that are listed here, including the above moderate income units. And many cities in the area do experience difficulty developing these very low income units and the low income units, but the kind of gap between San Bruno and other jurisdictions for moderate income and above moderate income is part of what we're trying to address with these zoning code updates. So these are, this is an idea of some of the proposed changes that could help to strengthen this. So we could, um, instead of a, like enabling um, developers to be able to pay a fee um, requiring the on-site rental um, development of affordable units up front um, and making alternatives um, a bit more uh, challenging to access for a payment of a fee could help to uh, facilitate production of these units faster. Um, and then you'll also notice on this slide that the rental units are kind of concentrated towards the very low income and low income brackets, while the ownership units are concentrated towards the moderate um, income brackets. Uh, and this is because oftentimes ownership units are difficult to access for very low and low income um, households and that's just because of the fixed costs of home ownership. Um, so it's often more beneficial to target the rental units towards those income brackets and then target the ownership to more moderate. All right, so just moving on to the other code updates. So as I mentioned before, there, is a, there are a few state laws that went into effect this year that um, will affect the accessory dwelling units chapter and the state density bonus chapter of the uh, zoning code. So um, in terms of the ADU and junior ADUs, um, this new state law, um, their junior ADUs and ADUs have to be allowed in single family zoning districts. Um, there are further revisions and reductions to parking requirements for ADUs, allowance of ADUs in multifamily zoning districts, which is new. And then there are reductions to setback requirements for ADUs. And then for the state density bonus, um, there have been some changes to state law regarding 100% affordable housing um, developments that we'll be addressing in this code update. Um, lastly, I mentioned some more administrative updates to help the city to more efficiently process um, and review applications. We'll be adding a new chapter for general administration, um, just updating the condominium section. 
um, also updating the architectural review permit section, and then updating the chapter 12.128, which is a mouthful time limit, renewal and revocation of architectural review permit, use permit, plan unit permit, or variance. Um, and that, uh, especially I think this commission has seen um, that the time limit clause of one year after approval um, has been challenging and that many projects have had to apply for extensions for that. So staff is proposing to extend that time limit from one year to two years. All right, in terms of next steps, staff is going to finalize the proposed ordinance amendments. Um, after getting direction tonight, there will be community communication and engagement on the issues. Planning Commission will review the proposed amendments and make recommendations to City Council. Um, and then City Council will hold a study session followed by a public hearing to introduce and take action on the amendments. So next, um, we'll move on to discussion from this commission on the issues. And just to kind of frame that out, the two objectives for tonight are really discussing what kind of active uses we want to see in the CBD, especially on the ground floor. Um, and then secondly, discussing the on-site affordable uni unit requirements. So that concludes my presentation. I, I'm available for questions um, and to facilitate discussion as needed. Thank you, Kelly. That was a great presentation. Um, so I'll invite uh, our fellow commissioners to provide feedback and ask questions about the objectives on the table. Um, is there anybody who'd like to start? Okay. Is the chair? Yes. Um, so you, you mentioned that the um, regarding the um, developers not being able to get through the permit process in a year. This year obviously it completely makes sense with COVID and all that. And we already saw we just saw a project recently come through the eight minute extension, which makes perfect sense. What other reasons are we seeing, you know, before COVID for projects not for you know developers not being able to get things moving in, in 12 months after approval? I think Pamela looks like she wants to answer this one. Commissioner Hamilton, through the chair, if I may. Um, that's a great question. So oftentimes, after the entitlement, um, the developer will have to go through a number of different applications, additional applications, final map, improvement plans, building permit, um, encroachment permit, demolition permit, you name it. Um, and oftentimes, um, it's a very aggressive schedule trying to get all of the necessary permits within a year. Um, if you were to um, get to, to, to have a final map recorded, the state actually allows two years for that exercise to be completed. So what we're proposing to do is align that entitlement stage with a map, possibly going to two years, and then also have the ability to have the developer coming back to Planning Commission or City Council for additional time if they wish. Uh, we've seen that during the recession. We've seen that during a hard time like this. So with the one year, it's putting a lot of burden on staff as, as well as the developer to keep coming back asking for the same entitlement. Sure. Okay, thank you. Um, is there any, has any study been done or, or proposed to perhaps happen in the future to look at our processes for all of that permitting to see if there's anything we can do on our end to streamline it? Because I, I would imagine that having, a, having a, a process that's known to be more streamlined and more efficient and you know, quicker to get through would, would um, make San Bruno more, um, more uh, lucrative for folks to want to come here and develop, knowing that they can get things done a lot faster because time is money. Um, that's kind of what we're doing right now. Um, so it's part of the effort. Um, what Kelly's great work is doing is that if you look at our current zoning map right now, most of the CBD and also within TCP, um, the zoning district does not align with the TCP or the general plan. So we have to create, not create, but we have to ask the developer to comply with additional process to get to the entitlement. So with the zoning code update effort, we're helping to streamline it so that it, so the zoning lines up with the general plan with the TCP, it will be a much more streamlined process. Great, that's, that's great. I, I would hope too that we could look at other, er, you know, at other areas. This is a wonderful first step and completely support it. Um, there might, you know, there's other areas in, in the, in other parts of the permitting process where we can find efficiencies as well, um, you know, after this is, after this is concluded. 
that might be a good idea as well. Well noted. Explanation. Thank you. Um, through the chair, uh, yes. uh, do we have to vote on extending the, the permit uh, period from one year to two years? Um, through the chair, if I may, that is not um, part of the um, objective that we're hoping to achieve tonight. We're hoping to um, focus your energy on the CBD, Central Business District, allowable uses and also requiring on-site affordable housing unit for new development. We have not fully um, finalized the zoning code update to extend a one year to two year is in the scope, but we have not quite finished with the exact language yet. Okay, thank you. Through the, through the chair, yes. uh, just a, um, so I have two questions. One is, I think I am understanding that we are kind of reviewing this zoning code ordinance update and making a recommendation to the council essentially on the body of this as to whether, is that basically right? Through the chair, not quite. Um, so this is a study session to introduce okay. you the scope that we're doing. Okay. So you will be getting another formal recommendation where the zoning ordinance is available, um, a draft ordinance is available for you to make a formal recommendation to city council. Okay, okay. And then second, I mean, I went through the packet uh, on Sunday night and I have fairly extensive notes which kind of fall into three buckets relative to this. One is about the objective. So I, I basically, I have some comments on the objective one and objective two topics, the the uses and the affordable unit requirements, and then I have some that don't really fall into either, but I would be interested in discussing whether that's tonight or at another meeting, like if we are going to have another opportunity on this, maybe that's okay. Um, but I just as a matter of process, do we want to sort of move on to comment specifically on objective one now and focus on that for a bit? Is that I think that sounds sensible, and I've, if I've learned anything, it's that uh, if you're allowed to talk about it, go and do it sooner <laughs> than later because yeah. you may miss may miss your chance. I'd, I'd say share with us your thoughts on objective one, yeah. and then maybe okay. any other commissioners who'd like to add to your bucket on commission on objective one. Okay. Um, Through the chair. Okay. Yes. Uh, excuse me for interrupting, uh, Commissioner Arrows. I just want to check with Pamela if there's an opportunity to address the definitions um, at all this evening. Um, of course, that's okay. definitely, yeah. Okay. That's fine, thank you. Okay, so shall I start? Yes. Okay, so um, in the table of uses that was being defined, uh, it kind of looked to me like we may have, I don't know if it's just like a sort of a printing error issue, but the way it was listed, it was saying that uh, home daycare, for instance, was listed as permitted on the first floor, whereas it seemed like that, you know, if it's home daycare, it would be in a, in a residential space, which would only be in the upper floors. Uh, and that, that basically seemed to go basically everything that had the note one and note two. I, I think it was just swapped. And, um, so I can respond to that really quickly. Um, so that you're right that home daycare would be basically consistent with where residential uses are allowed. And um, residential uses are allowed on the ground floor and the CBD on streets that are not San Mateo Ave. So it's possible that that note was just swapped incorrectly, which I apologize yeah. for. Well, and I, I mean, I think if you go through and look at the note one and note two items, it's pretty consistently, it seems to be, uh, Flipped. I mean, so personal services, like I would, I would expect if personal services is like a hair salon that's listed as second floor, whereas you would think that would be street facing. So I'm, yeah. Anyway, um, yeah. So I, I, I was a little puzzled by that. I suspect it was just that basically the two notes got mixed up. As long as long as those are swapped, I think generally the, that that all made sense. Um, I was surprised to see that we appeared to be excluding educational facilities even from second floor and above in the central business district. I don't I don't really see any reason for that exclusion. I've actually uh, taken classes myself in downtown Redwood City in upper floor sort of office spaces uh, through the UC Berkeley extension a decade or so ago. 
Um, I, yeah, I just, I, there was that. Um, and also in relation to educational facilities, we seem to be excluding vocational schools uh, in the San Bruno Avenue Huntington area. And it seems to me that with the history of auto businesses there, you actually might want a vocational school focused on auto um, training mm -hmm. in that area because to the extent that stuff is converting and some of those businesses shut down, we may have local uh, tradesmen who are quite skilled who could be offering that training. Um, and so I think we would not want to exclude that from that area. Um, I have a few more items. I don't know if I, don't, I sort of want to give space for other people to comment if they disagree with me or I can keep going. Keep going. Keep <laughs> okay. going. This is all good. And, okay. And, yeah. um, there was a category of social services and charitable institutions, uh, which was excluded from some zones. Where was this? Um, yeah, they were excluded from the station area, from San Bruno Avenue, Huntington, multi-use residential focus. Um, and I was thinking, is that similar to like a senior center or that American, our, our American Legion Hall that we have? I mean, what, I wasn't clear why they were being excluded from some zones. Um, and I guess, I don't know if you want to just note that down as a question and come back to it. Yeah, I'm noting it down. I mean, I think a lot of it has to do with the, the activation of the, of the street. So um, in terms of considering whether or not um, a social service or charitable institution would provide that, I mean, it would kind of depend on the institution, right? Mm -hmm. um, I have it down as um, permit, as conditionally permitted in both the CBD and in El Camino Real. But we can okay. definitely give some more consideration um, to, to the definition of it really and framing what kind of institution mm -hmm. would be appropriate for other districts. Um, but, and I can see that. I mean, I can see where it's like, if you're thinking like something on the order of like a shelter that might not be appropriate for that zone, you want it you know, nearby, but not there. Uh, versus something like an event-focused space, like the the you know the the hall. Um, right, and the definition of that right now, I'll just um, let everyone know, is a facility that provides social services directly to persons in need and includes food banks, soup kitchens, crisis centers, and other similar land uses. Okay. But we can definitely give some more thought as to where that would be appropriate and if that definition needs tweaking. Okay. Um, so moving on. Uh, I was just going to say, if, if check cashing establishments are the sort of classic payday lenders, have we considered just banning them entirely and trying to partner with a community bank or credit union to provide those services? Because that entire class of businesses is fairly predatory. <laughs> I'm just like, as a, as a thing to consider, like, I, do we actually need them? Could we, could we help people who need, you know, I mean, people do need to have checks cashed, but it's possible to do that without stealing 10% of their money. At least. <laughs> so they're only conditionally permitted um, within El Camino Real District um, in the current, you know, this is just a, a draft and kind of uh -huh. a, first, um, a first attempt at this, um, but we could definitely have some more conversations about that. I think that's well taken. Okay. Um, and I think that was all of my notes on the topic one. Do any other, other commissioners have notes that they'd like to add or questions they'd like to add regarding those topics? To the chair? Yeah. Um, well, I, I support a lot of the comments on um, Commissioner Harmon's. Uh, the one thing on the on the ca check cash is interesting that they're only permitted to be on El Camino, but that's prime property, prime real estate, right? So it's interesting that they can only be there, but it's the best place because they'll get all the visibility. And so I, um, it's just difficult to, to support something that, that is, um, well, as Commissioner Arrow says, stealing their money. Um, however, there are others, other ones as well. And I think there are other places that, I, that come up and, the gun place in El Camino. I mean, those kinds of things. 
that come up. Um, but uh, if there is a way to partner or do some things, it's certainly worth the discussion and expanding the thinking around it. Oh, um, I agree with most of uh, the comments from Commissioner Harmon. And I think in some of the office spaces that they could be allowed for training sessions and, uh, you know, uh, tuition parts of the office space could be used for that a dual purpose. Okay, thank you. Mary Lee, did you have anything else on your list? Um, not on, 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 not on the uh, first section. I mean, I have, my comments are a lot on the definitions, but because lots of the things have already been asked, it would only be redundant. Okay. Thank you. If there's uh, anybody else, Commissioner Hamilton, did you have, did you already share? You already shared, didn't you? I did. Okay. Um, I am, I knew that, um, Commissioner Harmon was going to roll up his sleeves and have some good ones. So I'm, I'm thankful. And actually, I, and I do, um, I do agree with, with everything that, that you shared that, um, a lot of these topics should be explored. And, and I do like the idea of, um, and it's something I'm, I'm still learning about and, and understanding how it works. But I do like the idea of, um, during these conversations, trying to further the, the good for, for, for folks, um, via, via planning, uh, topics like the check caching and um, being a little bit more flexible about providing um, maybe not conventional education, but um, but finding um, opportunities for education in places you might not expect. So I think that's really great. Um, and then um, maybe you want to dip into bucket two. I was, I was going to just quickly round out that topic because I bet that um I mean, the, vo the vocational tech one struck me particularly just because of the existing history of Sandrew Avenue, which I live, you know, a block and a half south of. And I mean, we certainly have our interactions with the auto businesses there that everybody has their complaints that, oh, they park their customers' cars around on the street. But, you know, they're community members still. And we don't want to, um, you know, sort of abolish that entirely. And so I, I did think that, that removing vocational uh, training from that area seemed um, unfortunate, specifically. Mm -hmm. And then on a, on a broader topic, I just, um, I don't know how much people are aware of, of international ways of doing things, but uh, if you compare zoning in the nation of Japan, the pattern tends to be that everything is permitted, but that which is forbidden. And in American zoning, everything is forbidden, but that which is permitted. Mm -hmm. uh, and the joke, of course, is that in California, everything is forbidden, including that which is permitted. But... Um, you know, I, I think we should be careful of that, you know, when we ban a use, I mean, it, coming back to permit it again, if we, if there's an exception is quite difficult. It takes, it takes a lot of effort. And so I, I would like to avoid ruling out activities unless we're really, really sure. Yeah. I'm, I'm guessing just jumping in on your thinking, I'm, I'm guessing that part of the reason for the, the, permitting or permitting, uh, of different purposes is probably to encourage more housing um, kind of at the forefront it sounds like of a lot of a lot of these um, areas um, and also not trying to, to nudge or manipulate things a little bit more um, to to be what it sounds like most people would would prefer however things do change and I guess we also have to consider building a certain amount of flexibility into um, into the code, so I think that's that's really valuable. To the chair, yeah. My last uh, uh, thought here is, you know, as we plan and develop for a robust community, and that's really the goal: robust and engaging and involved. How are um, and maybe it's a it's a question for Kelly? Is Kelly Kelly uh, bags not not you, Kelly? Uh, let's listen, but. Parking, you know, that's the parking piece that, uh, how does that come into play with all the components? So um, you may find some of these definitions that you see in this attachment to be familiar because they're actually identical to the definitions in the parking chapter that council adopted in February. And those standards are already um, in effect. 
So this will kind of be an, an act to, um, to that amendment. Thank you. And I'll also just note that, so this does apply to the TCP area. Um, you know, there are, there are pretty conservative parking standards for residential uses, but there is the option for TDM um, and, and low fees um, in these areas for the parking chapter. Okay, thank you. Mr. Chair, I did think of one more question in this topic, in this area before we move on to the next one, but I don't want to interrupt the current flow. I want to go to the next one yet. Okay. Well, I think now's your time, Commissioner okay. Hamilton. <laughs> so, um, one uh, one area that I think is is I, we're going to see a lot more interest in, um, just because of the changes that have happened in our society um, because of COVID and just in the, the the sheer difficulty that restaurants have to uh, stay open with costs is. Um, Ghost kitchens, and I think that's you know commercial kitchens where you you uh, a, 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 a business owner makes food, has an online presence. It's all delivery only, no no rest, no no tables, no seating, no parking required. Um, uh, just because it's just so it's so difficult to maintain all of that real estate. And I'm just wondering, looking at all the categories, where one of those would fit into the categories, just to make sure that we're not overlooking that. And you know, if it fits into one of the categories, great. Um, but if we're, if it doesn't, if something like that doesn't fit into any of those categories, I would want to make sure that we would be able to encourage those types of businesses in San Bruno. That's a very good point. Um, I mean, my first instinct would be to classify it as a restaurant. Um, and as you may recall from the parking chapter, the parking requirements for a restaurant are actually based on public floor area. So if there is none, um, it's possible that there would be very limited floor area that's required, but we can definitely try to work on the definitions to um, see how that would fall. I, uh, through the chair, um, so I, I really appreciate Tom bringing this up. It's a, it's a great thought. I mean, I would hope that we're not going to be in plague world forever, that this will be something that passes sort of by the time this is likely to be all adopted and, and super relevant. But on the other hand, I mean, we don't know that and, and things may happen again. So I, I wonder if, because I, I think in the long run, you know, in sort of normal situation, you would want the businesses, like particularly in the central business district, to be ones that are engaging, that people, you know, are sitting, you know, um, but it, but I wonder if what we actually want to do is to create flexibility in that definition of what a restaurant is to allow the restaurant to simply, you know, do more food prep in the space that normally would be public space. Um, and, and if this really is, I mean, it seems like it has to be a category change, like a, a, a redefinition of our business categories, that it's not a question of which business categories are permitted. And through the chair, if I could add something. Yes. You know, I, I would say I agree in, to Commissioner Harmon's point. A lot of times you might want to see, you know, you might want a more active use in the front of the building so that you do have that pedestrian activity. And you could have a ghost type kitchen in the back of the building where they're just preparing meals and then delivering, you know, out back. So there are creative ways. And that also gives, you know, new business owners that don't won't have to pay as much per square foot for a large building, they'd be able to have newer businesses that are able to come up that way. Exactly. <laughs> and Mr. Chair, I, want to, I just want to make sure that I um, I was clear. I was absolutely not advocating um, replacing restaurants with ghost kitchens. Um, even before COVID, you know, 80% of new restaurants fail. Um, it has nothing to do with COVID. And it's, it has to do with just the the cost of real estate and maintaining all of that, making maintaining all of that real estate all the parking requirements, all that stuff. I am. I would much rather see restaurants and foot traffic and vibrant, vibrant um, foot traffic in and out and all of that. Um, but I, I also want to keep our options open for our for our businesses. Through the chair. Yes. You expanded. Uh, Tom expanded my thinking on this. We had a San Bruno resident that that was a caterer. And, and his business was in Redwood City. Mm -hmm. And um, he actually leased his kitchen out. He he delivered certain days and he leased his kitchen out. 
so he had other people who could lease space to use that. And so is that some of the things you're thinking about as well? Is that yeah, it would be a business designed to do just that. It would be mm -hmm. so you know, it would be a large commercial kitchen that more than one more than one um, entrepreneur <laughs> entrepreneur exactly would be able to utilize whether they schedule it or work side by side or have it separated or whatever and be able to share that space for food prep and but it's for it's for delivery only and who knows maybe there could be a, a you know a walk up for takeout or something to on the, this particular on the business I'm sorry no go ahead this particular business also provided uh, demonstrations like a cooking class or an event night and invited, uh, and they called it, uh, uh, the, and so there were different ways of introducing the community to that business, and then he would then market all the other businesses that were there and had samples, and of course, it, the catering was the, the main thing. So it was a really interesting, productive, and professional process that was I was really appreciative of. I'm glad you raised that question. Thanks, Mary Lou. And and to jump in in the, the ghost kitchen concept, um, I know that um, Atlas Pizza has had a challenge with the square footage of, uh, of their building. And I know that that kind of um, met up with the parking requirements. And I don't know how the chips fell for them, but a situation like a ghost kitchen or kind of an alternative um, use in splitting their business um, that could be something useful for them. And so I, maybe just under the using them as a little bit of a guinea pig in your thinking, um, consider how, how we could be creative and, and help um, existing and potential businesses be able to divide their spaces. I, I did want to bounce back and kind of respond to something that uh, uh, Mr. Agnan had said a moment ago about. Um, I mean, I, I absolutely, and, and obviously as Tom expressed and as I appears ex previously expressed, like we all want <coughs> that active use with uh, customers being able to come in and sit in the front of the restaurant, you know, front of house, as they say. Um, I mean, I guess my, my point, though, was that, I mean, we are facing potentially another six months, potentially a year in which the space in restaurants that normally would serve customers is drastically devalued that at best they're going to be able to see half as many people at which point the cost of having the staff to serve them doesn't make sense you can't operate a restaurant at half capacity just you know like the you have to be operating at 75 80 percent seating um and so what i'm what i'm looking to do is say like can we simply redefine the category of restaurants such that if your restaurant can't use its public seating for the intended purpose that there are other purposes that, that, that can be happening in that space. I think some restaurants have been having some success with essentially selling groceries out of that space. And some of the ones that have pioneered that have been faced blowback from their cities where the city's like, well, you're not zoned for that, or you're not, you know, that's not your category of business. And I, my understand, I have read some stories in San Francisco and LA of that. And I think largely the authorities backed off, but, um, but I wonder if we could give certainty to these businesses just by, by, by sort of changing the category of what a restaurant means to allow for these more flexible uses. Um, because, you know, I mean, it's, it's COVID-19 in 2019, 2021, and maybe in 2030, it's an influenza or something, right? So like this may happen again. And, and if we could um, provide more flexibility to our, our business owners, I, I feel like that could be useful. Um, it is a little, we are, I think, stretching a little beyond the scope of this discussion, but as a, as a long-term goal, I think looking at broadening the definition of the, of the business and, and being, writing our code more towards, unless it's explicitly forbidden, we're cool with it, um, could be valuable. Yes. As, as my colleagues express more of their thinking, more ideas come to my head or more thoughts. And I'm noticing because of the restrictions of being able to dine inside, there is creativity about dining outside. And I wanted to just basically ask the question, uh, there was a time when Don Pico came before the commission wanting to extend their outside dining and it was denied. And so uh, I don't know if these are coming before the city for permits or whatever, or survival, and I'm not at all opposed 
but I want to be sure that we at least not someone come up with some official comes up and says you're not you know you're not within the means of of this you need to break down and there was a situation in San Francisco they were doing these uh, um, plastic pods and they had to remove them because of ventilation or something and so I'm and as Commissioner Hamilton said, we're beyond the scope of this discussion, but it doesn't have to be answered now, but it's certainly, I believe it needs to at least be taken back to discussion with staff or committee level of some sort to look at when we are in a crisis situation, we are supporting and allowing certain things to happen. And, and so is there a time limit or not? Is this okay forever or not? You know, and, um, there's all types of things. If you look at Camino Corner, who's doing a really amazing job. Uh, Celia's try, you know, they're just restaurants really making huge efforts. JC Booners, I saw the side of their area, which has zero parking, but they used that one section on the side of the building to create a really lovely dining area. And they're, they're stretching themselves to survive and each one is just really ex expressing the difficulties. You know, the owners are, we're doing Rotors doing a hometown Tuesday and we're frequently going to restaurants and they're telling us these things. So I'm thinking, okay, I don't want some official situation to come in place and say, sorry. So at least if we can, there could be some opportunity for discussion. And I'm not trying to resolve it tonight, but at least put it on the table. Um, it's through the chair. Um, I'm wondering if we could tie, you know, the permission uh, for restaurants to operate with uh, provision of wide uh, pavement, you know, to tie the two together so there's always room outside for dining. You know what I mean? Can you hear me? We can hear you. Uh, yeah, can, okay. can you elaborate a little bit on that? Yeah, uh, you know, often a restaurant is situation is situated where there's a very narrow pavement outside, so there's no room to have outside dining. But if we could tie uh, the location of restaurants to where there is wide paving, uh, you know, the, to provide outside seating, might be an idea or something to look at. Well, to, there, so there is um, there are new setback requirements for new developments, and there are requirements for. Um, public um, public seating and public um, facing uh, items in those setbacks. Um, but in terms of the existing restaurants that are operating that um, won't necessarily turn over in that way and become like a ground floor of a new residential building or something like that, I think they're kind of stuck in their existing condition. But there is room um, for new developments to have that kind of outdoor seating potential built in. Yeah, that's what I meant. Yeah, and the one thing I'll add, I think one of the one of the upsides of what we've gone through over the last five months is people are more open in general about using the right of way in different ways to support things like restaurant space. And I think as that normalizes more and more, not just in San Bruno, but everywhere, you'll see more expansion of uses that were used to be outdoor going into the outdoor and uh, in, indoor into the outdoor space like sidewalks and, and parking areas. Through the chair, if I may. Yes. So Aaron, on to, to layer on top of that, <coughs> the uh, CBD, the Central Business District, where we're trying to encourage uh, street facing businesses, restaurants and whatnot, what can we do in what we're talking about right now to include those things like they do in San Francisco and Burlingame, like parklets, where you could take a parking space or two and make it seating for a restaurant. Um, I, I think that would go a long way into bringing that experience uh, into the downtown environment. So yeah, I think if we can look at something like that in our planning, too. Uh, is there anything that you have for that? Yeah, I mean, I think a key thing, I mean, a lot of this is public works driven. So, you know, you, you figure out what your encroachment permit process is. You try to, to, with some of the other commissioners we're talking about, you try to standardize that much to create certainty so they're allowed to do it. From a zoning standpoint, it's usually pretty easy things like saying outdoor seating does not count towards the parking requirement overall, only indoor seating does. Or you're allowed to take up that parking space uh, you know, and that's not, you, you recognize that that's one parking space taken out of your whole downtown area, 
but you have a lot of heart, you know, you have a lot of other places that you could park in your downtown area that will, that will make up for it, you know, through different parking management strategies. So that, that's probably on the zoning side, but a lot of it is just really working out your public works rules, how you encroach in the right of way and what's generally accepted for those type of uses in the right of way. There's a lot of smaller effects you have to look at, like stormwater effects and things like that. But other cities have done that, and it's something that I believe San Bruno could do as well. Thank you, the chair. Yeah, I would, I would like to also, we're talking about restaurants, but there are other businesses also that want to extend outside of the, outside of their, uh, they have the limitation to be inside and uh, I don't want to elaborate into what types, but there, I don't want to limit it to just restaurants, but to be creatively thinking about other types of businesses that can or cannot be outside. And, and there are shorter term things you could do. You know, I know that there's a couple cities in the peninsula that just last night approved standards for uh, salons to move outside into their right away during the pandemic. So there's things that you could do long term to encourage it, and there's more uh, immediate actions that you may be able to take to support those type of businesses that are kind of outside the zoning code. They're more things that you do at a council well level to encourage those on a short term basis. You wouldn't want a vaping shop outside. Yeah, I know. That's, the state probably won't allow that either. Okay, thank you. Any more comments? And I, I, I feel like I'm using your, your buckets, um, Commissioner Harmon, as a, as a little bit of an outline. Um, but maybe we're ready for your next round. Yeah, I'm, I'm happy to, to start again if, if nobody else is eager. I say go for it. Okay. All right. So in the, in the topic of the affordable housing updates, um, I, I wondered, I mean, have, have staff been conversing with any of the regional nonprofit developers like Mid Peninsula or Bridge Housing to, to uh, so I know Bridge Housing is, is heavily involved in the 50% affordable Balboa Reservoir project, which has had some approvals up in San Francisco recently. I believe they were involved with the affordable units for, um, I think it's Passages, which was approved by the San Mateo City Council last night. That's right. Um, you know, I mean, like, they, these seem like people who would be able to, to help inform, like, what helps them produce the very low-income units that we are obviously woefully short on. Um, so I'm just saying, have, have they been included in our conversations? I could chime in a little bit through the chair. Um, we have been in contact with these developers, um, which is a little bit beyond um, the objective tonight. So if you remember Kelly's presentation point out that we have an existing affordable housing um, requirement, 15%. Most of the projects so far have um, not provided on-site units. So we actually have affordable housing fund about a little shy around $4 million. So we're working on getting an RFP out to ask consultants to help us spend the money. Or do we do we partner up with a nonprofit organization to administer our own units? Do we want to start construction? Uh, I mean, if we do want to start construction, bridge housing, peninsula housing, there's a lot of good developers out there. But with $4 million, um, there's really very little that you can do. So those are kind of options that we're contemplating for the time being. What we're asking is maybe we want to strengthen the affordable um, housing requirement for at least the rental units to have these to build on site. Um, so if you were to look at our web page dedicated for affordable housing um, index fee, the impact fee, the fee is not equitable to actually providing a unit on site. So a lot of developers have opt out to uh, fee out. So, so to kind of long answer to answer your quick question is yes, we have been in communication with a lot of developers, um, but the real question is, there's not much we can do at this point with less than four million dollars. Okay. Yeah, I, if I could just add one thing to that, uh, to to Pamela's point, kind of there's the two buckets. You have your inclusionary housing bucket. That's what we're looking at today. Is how do you include a percentage of every market rate development to be affordable? And the great thing about that is it comes online right away. You don't have to wait to get the cash, buy the land, partner with a nonprofit, and then bring it on. Now, the flip side to that is there is a lot of upside to having those 100% affordable projects because a lot of times you could group people together and then provide services, services to them in that same building. Really, the big barriers to that 
are A, land, trying to get land, and then B, just subsidy, both at the local level and then usually at the federal tax credit level. And unfortunately, about 30 to 40 percent of the money that used to be available in federal tax credits are no longer there because of the corporate tax cuts that have happened during this administration. People just don't need to use those tax credits anymore. So what can we do from a zoning standpoint? A lot of it relates to density and the density allowances for uh, affordable housing developers. There's a state law that passed uh, 1763 that allows essentially unlimited density within the form of a building uh, for 100% affordable housing developments within a certain radius of transit. And I think our transit corridor area is well set up for that. Um, so I think we will be able to see some, San Bruno will be able to see some traction there um, because of the way the transit corridor plan is set up to incentivize 100% affordable housing in those areas. Well, I do want to observe on the 100% affordable project. I mean, obviously, for people that need you know, social services or for seniors, there's there's obviously like you know great value and sort of concentration. Um, I, I do think there is also merit to economic diversity that that you know the sort of the the lawyers and the software engineers living next door to the baristas and the you know right that that like there's there that social mixing has a a value as well. No, absolutely. I think there's trade offs with both. And then even in particular, when you do have that 100% affordable housing develop, make sure it's part of a mixed income community overall so that when people are, you know, it's, it's, it's not concentrated in that way overall from the neighborhood standpoint. Right. And I have, a, I have a question on this, um, the in lieu of fee. Um, is, 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 how can I say this? Is this a time where we're considering the actual cost of the fee? Is this a time where we would actually in increase the rate of the fee to a point where it would be more useful and would accumulate so that it would be more realistic more quickly to uh, to build uh, some of these uh, units ourselves? And at what point does it become such a burden that nobody would want to develop here? And is this are we talking about this, this now, or is this a whole different topic? Uh Yes and no. Um, so the the fees are assessed through a nexus study. Um, so the fee, the current fee has been established since looking at my notes about 2018. Um, so it needs to be re-indexed every so often. So we're not quite there yet. Um, but at the same time, our current inclusionary ordinance says that you could provide on-site or do um, fee out. So what we're asking is to straighten that requirement to do to require you to do on-site unless you have provided a, a substantial reasoning for council to consider an alternative to fee out. And then the next step can be that we prepare another nexus study to look at the real cost for these impact fee um, and realign it and update that. So it's kind of a two prong approach. Yeah, because it sounds like you don't, it sounds like both are valuable. I mean, having right. any fees is valuable, but it's, it's about striking the right balance. Right, right. And if, if we make fee too low and too easy, you know, they're going to go that way. But we don't. We also don't want to discourage development on the other right. hand. Right. No. And we're also proposing a little bit more detail to what sort of um, affordability um, that a developer should propose. Right now, Kelly, correct me if I'm wrong, I think we're asking 9% for low and very low and 6% for moderate. So what the zoning ordinance uh, amendment we're proposing um, 10% of low and very low or 5% uh, moderate, something along that line to be provided on site for rentals. Um, for single family housing, housing, they're slightly different. Um, and then also for um, owner occupied. So that's the, that's the current requirement for any time that you're developing more than five units, you would have to do 6% of very low and 9% of um, moderate. And that's the same for rental and owner occupied. And what we're proposing is to do five to ten percent, very low, nothing in the moderate bucket. Still come up with the fifteen altogether. So it's up to the developer to do five very low, ten very low, but you got to have ten, uh, fifteen altogether. 
and then uh, moderate for owner-occupied units. And reason being is that when you have a rental development, this is where the deeper availability can come in. Okay, um, and just to, to touch on the, the no moderate, if I'm not mistaken, going back to the, the table where you showed how much we've actually been providing for our arena scores, if I'm not mistaken, I think that we had zero, what was the moderate? The moderate was actually fairly low as well. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Moderate, um, you provided 47 out of 205 units, so it's about 23% complete. And our, and our arena cycle is more than half over. Correct. And just out of curiosity, the above moderate income units, I just assume that that, that wouldn't be regulated by anybody. That would just be market rate. Is that right? Is that just because we're basically not providing any housing? So some jurisdictions do still like deed restrict those units to a certain percentage of AMI. Um, so there can be a deed restriction, but you're right that, you know, it's, it definitely is for people making more than 120% of um, area median income. I, that's interesting. It just, it's strange to me that that would be something that would be monitored. Measured. Monitor. Yeah. I think it's, I mean, Pamela might be, or Aaron might be able to um, comment on why that is monitored a little bit more. I, I think, you know, the state's overall policy goal is that a lot of the housing, like you have to have the supply side in order to make the overall housing market work. And so I think that's where it's getting at the above moderate. But there, you're right, those are mostly 99 out of 100 of those are market rate units overall. There may be some deed restrictions to allow up to 150% AMI, but in general, the your market rate developments. At the same time, uh, you know, state policy recognizes we're in a deep hole right now, and there's a lot of folks that need uh, affordable housing at the uh, below market rate, so then you have those other goals as well. Um, but the moderate, low, and very low usually require some type of subsidy or some type of development incentive, while the above moderates do not. Okay, thank you. Oh, I, I, yeah, go ahead, Commissioner Herman. Sorry, was somebody else asking? I, okay, I can go ahead. Yeah, I mean, you're, what uh, what Cheryl Lathan just brought up was kind of half of what was going to be uh, my next question, which was basically like, I mean, rather than just requiring this, could we look at raising fees to get this balance right? And so it sounds like that's been adequately answered. The other half of my question there was, um, <clears throat> What happens with sort of fractional units? I mean, so if you have an eight unit building, you can't have like 10% of an, you know, right, that'd be 0.8 units. It's like, do we collect essentially like 80% of the in lieu fee in that case? And right, so you just like, you don't produce the unit or if it's a five unit building, right? Where 15% of five is even less than one. Do we, do we collect the in lieu fee on that fractional unit? I think that's a policy choice of either collecting. Yes, I think a lot of jurisdictions do collect um, collect the fractional um, and, and then lieu fee, um, or you could provide for rounding. Yeah, there actually we do have a rounding provision in the current um, affordable housing program. So depending on where MAC lands, um, it tells you to either to run it up or run it down. Hmm. Yeah, I mean, I think I, I feel like. I mean, certainly, you know, I mean, if we if we would like to see some sort of missing middle housing where you have sort of small apartments, small plexes, um, you know, if you sort of like do a do a project that's like sort of a pair of triplexy structures where it's six, it's a six unit project. Like, I, I feel like giving people the opportunity to to build those. Um, I don't know. I, I think the I, I think I would favor allowing sort of a fractional in lieu, um, although we might need to look at raising what the in lieu value is, it sounds like. Yeah. Um, and then I, uh, I was looking at Mountain View's calculations for how they do it, where, because I mean, it looks like what we are proposing right now is just, it's like, you just have like a sliding scale where it's like five to 10% of, VLI and 10, yeah, right, like, 
I, I thought that the approach they were taking, and I, and I think I'm following the math right, that right they're using the 30% extreme low, 50% very low, 80% low, and then um, I was unclear if, if 120 is what they're using for moderate as the top of the range, or whether they were counting moderate as 100. But, um, that is generally accurate. Yeah. It depends on the county, but. But yeah, and then they were taking a weighted average and saying like, okay, like you you must offer at least two levels, and you must hit this average, and then you can sort of smear it across all of them. And I, I thought that was an interesting, flexible approach. I mean, I feel like if we do this sort of five to ten thing just in the very low, that like they're basically just always going to do five and ten of the next like. <laughs> Because I mean, the developers pretty consistently, you know, the the lower you go, the bigger the subsidy that unit needs. Right, and just to clarify, I think what staff is proposing um, here is just to, I I would like to see more clarity and not a range actually developed here. Um, it just is a question of, you know, the the benefit of having more very low income um, housing units is very big, but it's also a, a greater burden to developers. Um, so if we want to lower that at five and then keep this at ten, but I would definitely recommend clarity in these. In yeah, I'm, I I guess what I'm interested in is looking at like you know saying like you can put units in any of the categories: extreme, very low, moderate. Um, but you do have to hit a certain average number, which means that right if you if you move one up to moderate, you're probably going to have to move one down from low to very low, and that that that. Um, I thought that model that Mountain View, I mean, obviously it would be interesting to know how successful Mountain View is being with that model, how long they've been doing that. But I, I thought sort of that conceptually, it seemed like a, a, an interesting framework that we might want to consider. Yeah, I think that's actually a pretty good best practice overall is that you allow some flexibility, but at the city's discretion. Um, I've seen that, I, I worked on another ordinance in Redwood City where we had a similar uh, out in it, what it basically said, you could, the, ch the ranges may change at the council's discretion, but it, it results in the same financial burden to the development. So there could be a time within our arena cycle where we need more extremely low units and we don't need moderate units. So we might say it's okay, but more extremely low um, and your averages might be different, but the same financial subsidy to affordable housing is given. So I agree there should we should have something that allows some flexibility to, to be achieved overall. Is there a way for us to, I mean, like, it, like, so what, what, what Mountain View's model is doing is their, their, their metric, the thing that they're averaging across is this percent of AMI. Is there any way for us to, with reasonable confidence over the course of, two or three years to, to say what we think the subsidy is, because then we could directly target the metric of we must, you know, like we're going to allocate a certain amount of subsidy to this and you can choose whether that's more moderate units or subsidizing, right? You, you... It would be pretty difficult because there's two kind of variables that are out of our out of our control. It's what area median income is and that adjusted, but not a lot. And then what the difference is between the affordable unit and the market rate unit, which could fluctuate pretty wildly. Um, but I think we could look into this more when we bring it back and have you know different options of and understand what the upside and downside are of those options. Yeah, I mean clearly the AMI, the what Mountain View is doing is a heck of a lot easier. Um, but it does seem like if we could, I mean, you because you obviously would not want to have to adjust it like on the fly, month to month. That would be really bad. Um, but if you could, if you could, with reasonable confidence at the scale that these projects work on, um, that that actually seems like that would be sort of the ideal metric to target. But um, okay, uh, yeah, and that's that's my notes on this topic. I do have a couple notes that are kind of outside of this, if we want to discuss uh, after. Um, but but I will see the floor. Let's pause there. I think that uh, Commissioner Hamilton. Uh, had a response. Yeah, well, I have a, I have a question. This is um, off of uh, one of Commissioner Harmon's um, comments, which is very, very apt and very correct. That you know, when you've got the different buckets, the the low the lowest buckets get the, less, the least amount of attention, especially if you have a if you give them the option. 
um, because they require the most subsidy. When we look at the um, in the appendix, the uh, com the comparison of all of the neighboring cities and what their what their um, requirements are, you can see that San Carlos kind of flipped it on its head and is requiring 15% total, but it's 10% very low and 5% low. Yeah, yeah, this one here. Do we know? Did that discourage development? Did that you know? Do, do we have we talked to anybody in San Carlos to find out if how that's working? I mean, I, I would imagine they did that because they're looking at they're probably looking at similar numbers to ours, seeing that there's nothing very low happening. So you know, and trying to encourage it, but um, or or trying to you know kind of force it to happen. But do we know if if that had any kind of adverse effect? Or, that, or how long has that been in place? Yeah, so that, that was adopted relatively within the last year. So I don't think we would have a chance to see what the unintended consequences or intended consequences of, of that are. Um, the other thing that I forgot to mention, the third variable is the state density bonus law. And that allows additional density above the base that the city offers and allows some concession that is tied usually to deeper affordability. So there is somewhat of an offset if they provide extremely low and, and very low that they're already getting through the state that might encourage them. So that's why you actually see a lot of developers uh, propose at the low and very low, both for density bonus reasons, but uh, some that are doing tax credit projects, 20% tax credit projects also do it for the same reason. Okay. All right, thank you. Okay, any other commissioners or should we let um, Commissioner Harmon get on with his grab bag? All right, grab bag time. Where'd everybody go? Sorry, I stopped sharing my screen. Can you see everybody now? Yes. Commissioner Harmon, here we go. Sorry, I was muted. Yeah, so I just, it's just up two, and they're both um, probably things that I mean, maybe other people want to respond to, but they're things that I think maybe sort of get thrown to it, the agenda of a future meeting. One is we brought up there was the ADU and JADU uh, ordinances, um, which I'm a little bit familiar with myself because I'm planning to at some point build an ADU in my yard, and so I've been paying attention to that. Um, <clears throat> uh, We've had discussions in the past about uh, the restrictions on building ADUs or new residential floor space in the, I believe it's the 70 or 75 decibel noise contour, that that seems to be just outright forbidden because of some relationship we have with the airport district. Um, and I would like to at some point have a real conversation about what we could do to change that to allow our neighbors that are inside those nice contours to, to be able to take advantage of uh, the opportunity to you know house a house an aging parent or or you know whatever they want to do with that uh, space um, and if that means that we require some sort of negotiation with the airport where we say like we promise that anybody that does this as you know when they get their conditional use permits from the city that there will be a condition that says you're not going to sue the airport over the noise because you know about it then that's fine um, but this kind of goes back to the um you know let people do more of what they want with their own property um and uh i I mean, I have sort of wondered in understanding that like oh we have these rules against building there i've I've wondered if we are possibly violating state law on these new ADU and GADU rules if we're forbidding it, um, which would not be great. Yeah, so I think just the status on the ADU and um, JDU ordinance is that it's been drafted, but we're still working with council um, to just clarify those fine points of state law and to, to determine the amount of discretion the city has. And as you know, state law has progressively removed discretion from the city from being uh, allowed, be allowed to regulate and prohibit ADUs. Um, so that's kind of still a work in progress, and that's definitely something that we'll be investigating in terms of the airport noise contours. Yeah, it, yeah. The one thing I'll add to that, it was kind of an interesting situation where San Bruno and other airport adjacent cities were caught in conflicting federal and state laws. So on one hand, you have the FAA laws that don't allow new residential units to be built within the 70 to 75 decibel con noise contours. 
And the other hand, you have state law that says you're, you know, you're allowed by right to have these PDUs. And I think to Kelly's point, over time, I think people have recognized that state law should take precedent when it relates to this. But this is something we just have to research because there's not much precedent to look into it. But I think it's definitely trending in that direction. And I, I definitely, obviously, you need time for your research, but I would appreciate it when we when we do brief the ADU law of the ordinance. I would I would really like that to be included. Yeah. Um, and then my my other remark was, um, do we need to and do we want to nail down Civic Center as its own zone? Um, I mean, I know uh, a number of us probably know um, local uh, activist Jeffrey Tong, who's advocated for a couple of possible ideas about moving the Civic Center and library. But I think um, just in general, I think we should certainly be open to letting that, you know, prime real estate along uh, El Camino be, be developed into whatever else we might want on El Camino and, um, and perhaps moving the Civic Center closer to the the transit center, which I mean, depending on, you know, I mean, you could, you know, you could, you can fund the purchase of one plot of land with the sale of another, right? So, um, yeah, I just, I was, I was somewhat skeptical of nailing down Civic Center as its own zone, where it's like, say, oh, this is only for civic uses here. This can never be redeveloped into the other uh, same things that we have for the rest of the El Camino zone, as opposed to just saying this is all the El Camino zone, and yeah, we're allowed to have a Civic Center here. But you know, if we decide we want to sell the building, we don't have to now pass a separate zoning ordinance. So the TCP does, um, in the permitted use table, which maybe I'll um, bring back. I hope I'm not making everyone dizzy with sharing my screen and stopping sharing my screen. Um, hopefully, you guys can all see this now. It does uh, lay out a civic center um, designation. Um, just give me one second. There we go. Um, and it, it does limit the uses that are permitted within the Civic Center um, pretty evidently in this table. So just want to bring that up as this is the foundation that we're working from um, and trying to implement. Like, so I guess it was that a, those designations were adopted as part of the ballot measure, is that right? No, so the ballot measure is about, and Pamela, right. correct me if I'm wrong, but it's height, it's parking garages. So it's it's basically the um, items related to Ordinance 1284 that um, needed to be modified for the TCP to be implemented. Right. So, but so in that case, as we, I mean, the, the, uh, it doesn't sound to me like there's anything stopping us from saying as we finalize this zoning that you know, maybe that was a bad call. Well, I, I kind of do want to take a step back that um, the impetus of this zoning code update is to follow the existing general plan and TCP, um, where um, the current civic center site has been designated both in the general plan and also C um, TCP as a civic use. So um, if we do want to consider which, I'm not sure. I think it might might not be a bad idea to entertain this other idea of moving the civic center around. That will be going beyond the scope of what we're doing today. Yeah, and I, I, would say, I would say to add to that, one of the upsides of being the public jurisdiction is that if there is a time five years from now, ten years and then from now, when we decide to want to move our civic center campus. You can do. You could rezone the property or redesignate the general plan property at that time in order to take advantage of it. Yeah, yeah. I think in the, in the long run, keeping a single story building in that location, see, I'm, it seems implausible relative to the rest of the TCP. At first, um, to the chair, I'm sorry. Um, at first, hearing what hearing the. That idea it seemed it seemed like it would be pretty easy just to say well why not just make that entire area be El Camino Real and then the, the El Camino zone and then include Civic Center as part of that designation but then that also precludes moving it because you can only move it somewhere else within that zone then you would have to put Civic Center in all the zones and now it's starting to get complicated so I I think maybe just leave it as it is and approach it later as with a rezone if if such a project. Uh, becomes um, feasible. Uh, 
on that point, just to clarify, um, I, I, I presume from the conversation that we're having that it would not be, um, it, it wouldn't be too terribly difficult to revisit this at a time when, when there were more concrete steps to, to move the Civic Center. Uh, sounds like that's, they, nothing that we do now is gonna really prevent that from being a possibility down the road. That's right. Correct. That's, that's my understanding. Okay, all right. Does anybody else have any questions or things they'd like to share? Okay. All right, I think I'm done too. And if nobody else, um, if there's anything else, then I'll, I'll hand it back to Pamela and staff to finish it out. Sorry, I had it on mute. To the chair, when it's appropriate, I'd like to be able to ask some questions around the definitions. Oh, that's right, yes. Um, I think now would be a great time. Okay. Um, I don't know if these definitions are standard definitions taken from a particular state book or if there's, or they are uh, specific to San Bruno, but uh, I don't know that. And so, um, and maybe they need to be, some of them need to remain and stay this way, but these are just my thoughts around them. Um, and of course I read them all and some fall into to, um, one and the other. So I'll start with on page one, um, I, and I really appreciate that they were alphabetical, made it really easy to navigate through them. Uh, there is one that uh, boarding care after bars and nightclubs, about halfway down the page, that isn't in there. It is under it is under a different name. I believe it might be like maybe residential care, but residential care has a little bit of a different meaning. So either the meaning on the other side, the meaning could be uh, expanded or resident or given its own category. I'm not quite sure, but just could you um so the first uh, definition. Or the the use term, I suppose, the use classification that you're referring to is residential care facilities, or well, board, there isn't one. Well, I'm, I'm going. Let me just go down the list. Mm -hmm. Let me hold that thought for a second until I get to residential care. Sure. But we used to have applicants come before us to upgrade, change, implement new applications for board and care homes. Mm -hmm. That didn't reflect that, and so as I was reading it, when I got to other definitions. I'm wondering, are they related? could they be related? But uh, they were applying as board and care facility at the time. So I'm just going to go alphabetically down the list because it's a little hard to flip back and forth. So if you can just bear with me around it. So this may be uh, put a, a parking spot for board and care homes under the bars and nightclubs, and maybe it, it relates to something else. Okay, on the on the um, second page, the daycare facilities. There's daycare facilities. There's also home daycare, home daycare small, home daycare large. Uh, so, um, and they are, oh, you know, in this daycare center. That's basically that it's not residential. So I think it just needs a little more clarification around that. So just alphabetically daycare center and then there's home daycare. Now on home daycare, which would then be page three, there's the very first one that says home daycare. It's kind of an overview. And then it looks like there's another one, daycare large and daycare small. So it looks like it's three separate units when truly the top one is a description of large and small. And so I would like to also, if they can consider um, the, at this passage where it says home daycare facilities serve between one and 14 children, it's a statement about the two below it. So either indent the other two or different clarification, but the first one is truly just a descriptive. Okay. So the other thing that I think is important, just because this has come up at the planning commission meetings, is there any opportunity 
uh, to consider adding like adhere to Department of Social Care licensing regulations. And so that to me is a really important thing because there's a several confusing moments in the Planning Commission over the years that's come up and um, that they didn't have to be licensed because of because the fire department's going in there, the police department's going in there to clarify that they're licensed, but all family daycare, all daycare centers and family daycare homes are, need to be licensed. And they're not really called home daycare, they're called family daycare, family daycare, which is in the homes, resident, they have to be res the owners have to be in the residence, live in the residence, according to the regulations. So we could certainly take this off topic for more clarification, but I wanted to to um, bring that up. I appreciate the feedback, and you're right that um, that could be clarified by indenting the large and small home daycares mm -hmm. as falling under the home daycare umbrella. And I think that is also the case under uh, the residential. Okay, so going down alphabetically to uh, live slash work. Mm -hmm. um, does that include also where it talks about a space or a building or space that uses joint office? Does that include equipment, supplies, and other types of things? Um, a building that is used jointly for office, light industrial, commercial use combined with residential use. Mm -hmm. To store a bobcat. Or to store uh, uh, lumber or wanted to store, does that, is that equipment and supplies? Um, light, would, is that considered light industrial? I mean, st Lord, that's more of like a warehousing use, Aaron, feel free to chime yeah, in. I, I, mean, okay. usually, I mean, usually it would be warehousing would typically be within the light industrial category versus mm -hmm. the industrial would be more you're using those bobcats to move gravel around. Okay. Um, so yeah, storage is usually in that line, line industrial bucket. I don't re recall if, offhand if we have that definition of light industrial and whether or not it includes that. Okay, in that definition, it talks about light and in light industrial or commercial use combined with a residential use. That's why I brought up the uh, the, the yeah. topic is because if it's residential and if you're living next to someone who actually stores neat and tidy equipment. It, it's still yeah. verification that doesn't include those. Uh, does it have to be covered? Does it have to be, does it need to fit under an awning or, but, okay. And so then the next one, lumber yards. Uh, it's not uncommon for a lumber yard to have an ancillary um, supplies and equipment, you know, hardware, household and commercial supplies, uh, pipes, um, tubing for, air conditioning, flooring. And so this basically only talks about wood and lumber. So I don't know if you want to add, include materials or revisit that for that. As I say, I'm not trying to come up with a solution, but just at least bring up the topic so that there'll be discussion. Yeah, I'm looking at the, the definition as an area used for the storage, distribution, and sale of finished or rough cut lumber and lumber products. Mm -hmm. um, so I'm not sure if that could be interpreted to mean like kind of more ancillary, but we could clarify that. Okay, okay. The following page. An office medical, I think this falls under, this is a simple one. I think like when you, in the middle of it where it talks about examples, includes offices and clinics, that would be an urgent care, right? An urgent care? Yes, an urgent okay. care would be included. Okay, and then the parking structures, it talks about um, use for the parking and storage of vehicles. And storage, could that mean, could that be long-term? Can someone park there for several days? Uh, is this just for parking while you're in the commercial community? You know, just yeah, we could also work on clarifying that. Um, it may depend on the operator and their needs, but if we, if there was an interest in the planning commission and regulating a more, a longer term versus a shorter term parking lot, then it would be a good idea to clarify those two differences. Okay. Yeah. And I think that's particularly important because of 
airport parking tax and different things that we have related. Yep, yep, yep. exactly. I don't, I don't okay. think we want airport long-term parking in our downtown. <laughs> yep. And then in parks and recreation, it says it does not include health clubs, commercial amusement, recreational facilities. You know, with our new development at uh, San Bruno Park, we are going to. There is going to be. Maybe it's not a health club, but there is a gym there. It's, it's not, I don't know that it's membership or plans to be membership, but uh, and then commercial commercial amusement. I'm not quite sure what that means. You know, we have uh, various um, various um, uh, clubs in our community that use that for commercial amusement. You know, there is the 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 in the park the the concerts in the park and different types of things. So uh, when it says it does not include. And I think the reason that it does not include, because many of those uses would fall under commercial recreation and entertainment, um, okay. located at the top of page six. Okay, fair enough. So just trying to kind of, I think, separate a more public recreational use from a gym, a health club, um, a bowling alley, something like that. Sure, sure. Okay, on two, let's see, page when I printed this, I didn't have page number, so I'm like E and F. I apologize. Okay, no worries. I, I, I could write it on there. Uh, so we're into the reg residential care. And so in there, the first one, basically, it's a descriptive, and then it's got residential care large, residential care small. And typically, residential care is there, you know, people sleep there. So it's very different than family daycare that they don't sleep overnight. They take naps during the day, but they don't sleep overnight. So I didn't believe that home daycare or family daycare would fall under residential care because it's a whole different type of licensing. And again, I would want to be sure that they follow uh, regulations, Department of Social Service regulations. That's come up a lot over my 30 years. People were just basically confused because they felt that they were in compliance because the fire department, you know, they had the, the officials say, yes, it's, it's approved, but then they started getting parents in, licensing comes in and finds out that they're, they don't have a license. So somewhere along the line, you know, Aaron, we probably have had these discussions lots and lots yeah. of times. And I, I would like before my time and then my time on there that that piece gets on the map for it because it's, uh, it, it can be confusing. And because I've been in the field for 45 years of family daycare and center-based care, I, I know this stuff. So I felt pretty confident about it. And it also, in there, I should say licensed, you know, licensed residential facility, licensed residential. So adding that in there, because the city wouldn't want it to be unlicensed. Very true. And you're welcome to call me if you have any questions on this stuff. And I think in general, I think one thing we'll do when we bring back the draft is try to, not try, but we will align both our definitions and terminology with how the state uses their definitions and term terminology to avoid any confusion. Yeah. So on from the from the state agencies, it's Title, title 22 is what you want. And um, there are some things for Title 5, but they follow almost the same regulations. License is the key word that you're licensed and that you're um, and regulated. Okay, and then heading down that same page to single family home, it talks about uh, a structure including manufactured housing units designed for occupancy by one family. You know, we all know that there are family members that share housing. That uh, it's just, it's cultural. You know, it's. It's not uncommon for that to be the case. So I just want to be sure we think about that. And so by, is that considered one family that, you know, if you bring in grandma and grandpa to live there, is that considered one family? And it could be, you know, so, uh, but your neighbors will call you and say, there are, there are three families living in there. And I see three cars that are, you know, I see the grandparents leave, I see the aunts and uncles, da, 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 da. so. Um, yeah, that's a very good point, and it can get um, very dicey when trying mm -hmm. to define what is and what is not a yeah, family. And I'm not opposed to how families decide to live with one another at all. Yes, we'll we'll look at some other definitions to determine a best practice and how to describe okay. that. And then um, 
I don't know what supportive and transitional housing, you know, I, when I read this, I know what supportive housing is, but I, I couldn't quite, it didn't, it didn't uh, speak to me as to what, that didn't clarify to me what, if I read that, I'd have to stop and think with that. How does that apply to me if I'm applying for this? It says it provides a short-term or interim housing for individuals with mental health, addiction, or other special social services and programs. Because residential care facilities take in, um, uh, typically it's adults with special needs of some sort, mental health issues or whatever it may be. And also there are some uh, youth residential homes. That, that, I didn't bring that up at the top on residential. That could be for youngsters or for adults or does it need to say one or the other? But the support of transitional housing, how is that uh, different? These are the top and talks about transitional houses, orphanages, self-help group homes, you know, uh, there, there could be some relationship in that piece of it or putting mm -hmm. the book there or some thought in there. And I think I'm almost to the bottom of this. Okay, and then I think that's my last one coming up on um, I think some of the others where they talked about triplex and duplex, there's also talking about one family living there. So but most of them say one or more persons. So that okay, then the last one that I have is towards the end, gasoline and vehicle service stations. It talks primarily about retail sale. Dispensing of motor fuels, lubricants, uh, definitions, you know, of the, whatever. But there are sales of other types of materials. If you go on El Camino, uh, we've got one particular very, very bold sale of masks and all of the fun stuff that happens when there's a Super Bowl or a uh, you know World Series. They are selling other items there, and um, and if you if you want that to continue, then so you know that maybe it's a seasonal sale of some sort. Or not at all. I'm not quite sure, but I wanted to. Not really just only related, but they do sell other things that come up. I mean, our the gas station on El Camino and and Sneet that's become very creative. I don't know if you've seen the new dinosaur with them eating a a human a, a, a false human being. I won't mention names. Um, so instead, so, perhaps a good edit would just be to broaden the definition of these incidental sales. Um, to yeah, they're incidental of some sort. And I don't know if they're permitted or not. I have no idea, but uh, but uh, they, they, they're they very they're very visible. You know? So uh, if we're going to allow them, let's at least include them in some method of addressing uh, them. And I think that's it on the definition. Okay. And feel free to call me if you have any questions on the, on any of these uh, licensing kinds of things. I, I'm happy to help if it's useful to you. Thank you. All right. So, so Kelly, did you get all the information that you needed from Mary Lou Cornell on definitions? Yes. Okay. Yeah, I was taking notes on the sheet while she was talking, so it's very helpful. I'm happy to find another. Talk very, very fast. Is, yes, they're very important. Okay. Thank you. Do, do any other commissioners have anything they'd like to add? Okay. All right. In that case, um, we'll move from 4A on to um, item five, items from staff. Um, I need to ask for a favor to see if anyone is volunteering for the September Architectural Review Committee meeting. Um, I don't have... I think I have one or two items um, scheduled, tentatively scheduled, but we'll definitely confirm. So I see Commissioner Hill, Commissioner Harmon, and Commissioner Johnson. Thank you. Thank you, guys. Um, and then um, item six is our second public comment. Um, and this is the opportunity for any members of the public to raise their hand and um, on anything that was not on the agenda. Do we have, Madeline, anybody? raising their hand to participate? We do not have any speakers. Okay. So then uh, we'll move to adjournment. The next planning commission meeting will be held on 
September 15th, 2020 at 7 p.m. And again, it's yet to be. Was there comments from participants or was that it? Oh yeah, yeah. We need to start, are we agendizing that now? I thought I saw it on the agenda, I'm scrolling. Oh, maybe, you know what, maybe I didn't make my notes quite right. I probably didn't do my notes right. Um, yeah, commission. After the second public comment is items from members and subcommittee reports, number seven. Ah, okay, sorry, my, my mistake. It's a new edition. Well, oh. it's an added edition, I guess. Oh, good. Thank you. I'm sorry. And I, I'm not clever enough to, to make my screen do multiple things. Um, is, is there any, are there any reports or topics of discussion? I have a yes. question. So um, I uh, absolutely understandable because of everything that's happened this year. But um, at the beginning of the year, we, we had a uh, aborted um, uh, presentation of, uh, on code enforcement. I know code enforcement has now moved from planning under police and all that. So, and, and then, of course, with COVID, everything is different. But I'd just like to make sure that that's still kind of in the pipeline to happen at some point, because I think it would be really helpful. I will follow up and report back. Wonderful. Thank you. OK. Anything else? No? OK. Thanks. Thanks for catching that one. All right, so here we go, adjournment. Um, oh, the next uh, commission meeting will be held on September 15th, 2020 at 7 p.m. Check the website to see whether it will be Zoom or it will be in person. I presume it'll probably be on Zoom, but you never know. And um, the time is 8.48 p.m. and we are now adjourned. Good night. Good night. Good night.